Kama barakta ala Ibrahim wa ala ahli Ibrahim innaka hamidun majid Oh Allah bless our beloved Prophet Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and bless his family in the same way that you blessed Ibrahim alayhi salatu wa sallam and his family you are the most kind and you are the most merciful Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fi al-akhirati hasana wa qin a'zaban Oh Allah give us all every good in this world and give us all every good in the hereafter. Grant us all the heavenly Jannatul Firdaus and save us all from the hardships of the hereafter. Ya Rabbil Alameen. Rabbana Zulamna Anfusana wa illam taqfilana wa tarhamna lanakunanna min al-khasirin. Oh Allah we are only human, we make mistakes. Oh Allah sometimes we make mistakes. Advertently, sometimes we make mistakes inadvertently. Allah, all of the mistakes that we make, Allah, you are the forgiver of all mistakes. So please forgive all of our mistakes, whether they be major mistakes or whether they be minor mistakes. Ya Rabbil Alameen. Rabbana Fulana Waliwali Daina Warhamma Kama Rabbayani Salimira. Allah, bless us and forgive us, and especially bless and forgive our parents who looked after us. And be kind to them as they were kind to us since we were born. Ya the Jalal wal Ikram. Rabbana inna nasluka al Jannah, Jannat al Firdaus. Wa na'awuzu bika min al Nar. Wa na'awuzu bika min khidz al Dunya wa azab al Akhirah. Wa na'awuzu bika min azab al Qabr. Wa na'awuzu bika min azab al Hashar. Wa na'awuzu bika min azab al Yawm al Mizan. Wa na'awuzu bika min azab al Jahannam. Ya the Jalal wal Ikram. Oh Allah, we ask for our Uncle Aziz, Jannatul Firdaus. Oh Allah, we ask you to save him from all of the hardships of the hereafter, from the hardships of the grave, and from the hardships from the day of reckoning, and from the hardships of the fire of Jahannam. Oh Allah, grant him Jannatul Firdaus. Oh Allah, where there are beautiful streams, and where there are beautiful rivers, and where there is fruit of every type and every denomination. Oh Allah, and when we leave this world, oh Allah, let us be reunited with him so that we can spend an eternity together with him. And with all of our loved ones, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Rabbana inna nasluka al Jannah, Jannat al Firdaus, wa na'awuzu bika min al Nar. Ya Khaliq al Jannati wa al Nar, bi rahmatika ya Azizu ya Ghaffar, ya Karim ya Sattar, ya Rahim ya Jabbar, ya Khaliq ya Bar. Allahumma jinna min al Nar, ya Mujir, ya Mujir, ya Mujir, bi rahmatika ya Arhamar Rahim. Allah grant our Uncle Aziz every peace, every comfort, every happiness, every contentment, every serenity, every tranquility in the hereafter, grant him the highest of all in Jannatul Firdaus. Oh Allah, and save him from all of the hardships of the hereafter. Oh Allah, and save him from all of the disgrace of the hereafter. Oh Allah, let us be with him, oh Allah, while we are alive. Let us lead lives which are complementary to Islam. And when we leave this world, let us be reunited with him. Let us leave with Allah, ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. In our hearts and on our lips, Ya Dal Jalal wal Ikram. O oh Allah, you are the most kind, you are the most merciful, you are the master of the day of judgment. We worship you alone and we ask you for all help and we ask you for all assistance. O oh Allah, we ask you to guide us towards the right path, the path of the people whom you have blessed. And we ask you to save us from those people who have earned your anger and those people who have fallen into temptation and through temptation have gone astray. O Allah, you are the most kind, you are the most merciful, you are the creator, you are the maintainer, you are the sustainer, you are the provider, you are the giver of life, you are the taker of life, and you are the most forgiving. O Allah, we ask you to forgive all of our sins, whether they be major sins, whether they be minor sins, O Allah, and we ask you to change all of our sins into reward, and through this reward, grant us all Jannah and through those who have Jannah and Wali Karam. Rabbana taqabal minna, inna ka anta s-salimu alim, wa tuba alayna ya maulana, inna ka anta tawabu rahim. O Allah, bless and forgive the living, bless and forgive the deceased, bless and forgive our present, bless and forgive our absent, bless and forgive our men, bless and forgive our women, bless and forgive all of our children. O Allah, and let us leave lives of good to Islam, and give us faith, and happiness inside our hearts and give us that peace and contentment inside our hearts so that we are happy with everything that we have in our lives and make us from amongst the most thankful of your servants and forgive us for all of our mistakes. Ya Adhan Jalal wa Ikram. O Allah, you are the acceptor of all prayers. We have raised our hands to you. We have closed our eyes in front of you. We have opened up our hearts to you, Ya Allah. O Allah, all that we ask is that you accept our humble prayer on this beautiful afternoon. Ya Adhan Jalal wa Ikram. محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين يفرج سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين 
Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alamin Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alamin Bifadli la ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah Thank you for your kind attention. Inshallah, um, today, just for today, I think us of prayer will be at half past three, inshallah, Aziz. So we'll have um, just, just like that, inshallah, Aziz. Yeah. 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 Inshallah, we'd like to continue with the next part of our program, inshallah. And which is the Sirat of uh, part of our program, inshallah. So, our uncle, inshallah, will um, explain about this program, inshallah, to you now. Come, when are you here? Well, as I said, we start the other section of the program, and this is a two part as well. This is to do with the uh, <coughs> And because of the function to the improvement of seeds, we have um, shortened the time of speeches. So I hope um, Brother Wazir can speak in a short time. As to cut the time down. Uh, of course, I mean, I can't make an introduction, but, but uh, Wazir is so much. He's one of our imam in this mosque. He's one of a teacher in this house, and he has been around here for many, many years. Many of you have known him, so there's no introduction to him at all. I mean, for myself, I know he's a very good speaker, and articulate in his speaking, and in his demonstration of what he spoke about, what he speaks about. So, brothers and sisters, because of that, can I ask Brother Wazir straight away to explain? And this is the new Sirach Nabi Bamshi. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, the Rabbil Alameen. What's the letter? What's the letter? I'll see you in Muhammad. 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 وحده لا شريك له له الملك وله الحمد وهو على كل شيء قدير وأشهد أن سيدنا محمد عبد الله ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم أرسله بالهداء ودين الحق ليظهره على دين كله ولو كره الكافرون ولو كره المنافقون ولو كره المشركون وَلَوْ كَرِهَ الَّذِينَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ وَلَوْمِ الْآخِرِ أما بعد My brothers and sisters in Islam My responsibility today is to talk about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam It is an extremely difficult task to talk about someone in approximately 20 minutes to cover a lifespan of approximately 23 years and with the greatness of his purpose and mission and with the fullest explanation for us to understand that purpose and mission pops is virtually impossible. But we can summarize it in a few words for just a few minutes so that we can understand the greatness of purpose and the greatness of mission. The Prophet وسلم, when we talk about him, the messenger, the last messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, <coughs> Muhammad وسلم, the greatness of his purpose and the greatness of his mission is not new. The mission that he came to explain to humankind is not rocket science. In fact, it's a repetition of the very message that was given by all the previous messengers and prophets that lived on the face of this earth. He summarized it 
in the form of the Qur'an, which is the revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us of this in the Qur'an, in Surah Al-Baqarah. It says, وَقَالُوا كُونُوا هُودًا أَوْ نَصَارًا تَهْتَدُوا قُلْ بَلْ مِلَّةَ إِبْرَاهِيمَ حَنِيفًا وَمَا كَانَ مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ It's a very important ayah in the Qur'an, in Surah Al-Baqarah, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us that they said, قَالُوا كُونُوا هُودًا أَوْ نَصَارًا تَهْتَدُوا That be a Jew or a Christian, and you are rightly guided. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responded to that very strongly. Qul, say to them, Ya Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, bal millata Ibrahim hanifa. He's not talking about millatu Muhammad, bal millatu Ibrahim hanifa. He said, say to them, that indeed, the system of Ibrahim alayhi salam is the upright system. The system of Ibrahim is the upright system. Meaning that the system that Muhammad is preaching is not a new system. It's the same system of Ibrahim But he was not among the polytheists. He was not among those people who worshipped aspects of Allah's creation. He was not among those people who associated partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Kulu, the next ayah. Kulu amanna billahi wa ma unzila ilayhi wa ma unzila ila Ibrahim wa Ismail wa Ishaq wa Yaqub wa Yisbaq wa ma utiya Musa wa Isa wa ma utiya nabiyuna mi rabbihim la nufarriku bayna ahadim minhum وَنَحْنُ لَهُ مُسْلِمُونَ It's a very important ayah in the Qur'an that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, as Muslims, this is what we should say, قُولُوا آمَنَّا بِاللَّهِ That we believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْنَا And what was revealed to us? وَمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَى إِبْرَاهِيمَ وَإِسْمَعِيلَ وَإِسْحَاقَ وَيَعْقُوبَ and we believe in the same revelation, the same message or the mission that was promulgated by the previous messengers, that of Ibrahim and the tribes. And the same mission that was propagated by Musa and Isa that we make no difference. We do not differentiate in the purpose of their mission, in the greatness of purpose, and in the greatness of their mission. We do not differentiate. This is what Islam stands for. In fact, if you look at it from a logical point of view, all Muslims, and as we are Muslims, most of us who are here, we do not deny the existence of Isa alayhi We do not deny the existence of Musa alayhi We do not even utter a, a word of rebuke against Isa alayhi that is Jesus. Nor do we utter a, a, a word of rebuke against Musa alayhi irrespective whosoever is being respectful to them or not. It is not even permissible in Islam. We cannot say that. In fact, in the Qur'an, if you read the Qur'an carefully, you will find that the name Muhammad وسلم, is only mentioned four times in the Qur'an. Imagine a book that was revealed to him, specifically to Muhammad وسلم, to promote and to propagate to humankind. His name is only mentioned four times. The name of Isa السلام, is mentioned 25 times. The name of Musa السلام, is mentioned 136 times, at least. The name of Maryam السلام, is mentioned at least 34 times. The name of Ismail is also mentioned than Ishaq. If you were to understand the genealogy. So what was the mission? What was the greatest of purpose behind all of that? The greatest of purpose and the greatest of mission is that it consolidates 
the truth that was previous, previously preached by all the messengers of Allah, by all the enemies, and it still stands out to be the truth. Of course, when you have the truth, you have a lot of attacks against it. You have a lot of reproaches. You have a lot of difficulties. But in the midst of all these difficulties, in the midst of all these attacks, the truth still stands out. Because it's a revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a revelation from the Almighty, Al-Hakim, Al-Alim. It is a revelation from him. And he himself says that he will protect the purity of the Quran. That we, that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, has revealed the dhikr, the Quran. And indeed, we are protecting it. Not we will be protecting it. That we are protecting it. A continuous process that began somewhat 1400 years. Maybe 1450 years ago, approximately, when the first ayah was revealed to Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, we have got the same revelation intact, in purity. How do we know that? You know, as Muslims, you can always boast that we have got the original text. We can always boast that the other texts that the people claim to be the text or the original text of their religion or their faith is not the original text. But how do we know that the text that we have is the original text? We can look at various scholars as to what they say. For example, from the University of Cambridge, John Burton, in 1977, wrote a book, The Connection of the Qur'an. And he says that the information in the Qur'an itself has been organized and approved by the Prophet. That text that is in our hands is the Mus'haf of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We also find similar comments being made by Kenneth Craig in 1973 in a book called The Mind of the Qur'an. And he says, in terms of the information being cascaded from generation to generation, he says the purity of the information is a living sequence of devotion, of devotion a living sequence of devotion referring to Muslims themselves been taken care through the, through the process of memorization from one generation to the next in order to ensure that the purity of the Qur'an is still there. So William Moore, in his book, The Life of Muhammad, in 1894, although he was one of those great critics of the Qur'an, he says that there is probably no book in the world that maintains its purity for 12 centuries. There is probably no book in the world that be maintained 12 centuries a text so pure. In fact, it's just a, the understanding of what he said. But again, he brings out the understanding fact that the Quran, as we have today, in this year of 2011, is the same Quran that was propagated by Muhammad sallallahu because of the greatness of the purpose, the greatness of the mission. When we talk about the greatness of the purpose and the greatness of the mission, we must have a man who addressed an issue from the beginning of creation. A lot of our Muslims today think that Islam only began with the advent of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa But no, Islam did not start at the point of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa That was the last phase in the chain of revelation. When we talk about the revelation of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, it's not a new deen, it's not a new religion, it's not a new system. It's the same old system that Adam alayhi salam promoted. It was the same system that Sulaiman alayhi salam promoted. It was the same system that Ibrahim alayhi salam promoted. It was the same system that Ismail alayhi salam promoted. It was the same system that Yaqub promoted. It was the same system that Isa promoted. But it was formulated with the advent of Prophet Muhammad It was the same system in terms of purpose, in terms of the greatness of purpose, and in terms of the greatness of mission. 
This is what the Prophet ﷺ has taught us. In fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands him in the Qur'an. Because when we talk about the greatness of his purpose and greatness of his mission, does not only lie in the kitab, but does also lie in his characteristics. It also lies in his lifestyle, in his example. That indeed, you have got a magnificent example in the lifestyle of the Prophet For him who believes in Allah and the last day. A magnificent example in the lifestyle of the Prophet How do you know that? Have you made the Prophet an example in our life? Is he part of our life? Is he part of our thinking process? Is he part of our daily activities? Is he part of our studies? Is he part of our mission? Is he part of our aim? Is he part of our objective? Is he part of our purpose that we have in life? If the answer to that is in the negative, well then we need, then we need to restructure our way of thinking. Because this is what the Prophet has taught us. It is characteristics. The Prophet has been commanded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is taken from Surah Al-A'raf, which is chapter 7, verse 199. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that this is the mission of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa If you examine his lifestyle, then you will understand what he means. Hold to forgiveness. And command to that which is right. And turn away from foolish people. In fact, the whole of the seerah, the lifestyle of the Prophet was an embodiment of forgiveness and mercy. That is why Allah says in the Quran, that we have not sent you, O Muhammad, except as a mercy for all the world. The words of mankind, the words of jinn, the words of galaxy, the words of human beings, even the words of animals. He has been a rahmah. Rahmatan lil alameen. So let us look at a few instances where the Prophet has exemplified this form of forgiveness in his lifestyle. Sometimes in crisis and enmity, that's the time when we can express our anger and we can see the bad bit of our character in anger and during enmity. You know, when you have friends, everything goes well. We all enjoy it. It goes nice. Even the bad things you don't want to tell him. But when you have an enemy, he's fighting against you. And he is the one that's constantly after you. He wants to defame you. He wants to denigrate you. He wants to put you to the gallows. And these very enemies of yours begin to say good things about you. Then it becomes something of a magnificent nature in itself. We can look at the lifestyle of the Prophet We have examples of the Iqrah and before he accepted Islam. He was so scared of the Prophet because of the conquest of Mecca and because of the success that he had. So he actually, he, he, he got away from the Prophet His wife accepted Islam and she brought him to the Prophet and he said, here is Iqrah, the man who used to fight against you. So the Prophet he said, yeah, it's all right. There is nothing for you to worry about. You are free. Do whatever you want to do. And he was amazed. A man that he was constantly against and even wanted to kill became so forgiven just in the spell of a second. It was the same instance or similar incident that relates to the Safwari Ibn Umayya. That after the conquest of Mecca, he flew to Jannah. And he was actually living in fear. Because at that time, the Muslim, the Muslim population increased rapidly. So, when he was asked about the Prophet ﷺ, he said that for him to be free, for him to feel safe, he wanted two months to consider what the Prophet sallallahu is saying. So the Prophet sallallahu said, there is nothing for you to be fair of. That I will give you four months instead of two. So the Prophet sallallahu gave him four months. During that process, he considered and reconsidered 
the things that he used to do to the Prophet ﷺ. And eventually, because of the forgiveness of the Prophet ﷺ, he accepted Islam on that basis. You have also seen the Abyssinian slave that who killed the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, Hamza, the wife of a Sufiya, Hind, who literally ate the liver of Hamza during the Battle of Uhud. And despite that, when she accepted Islam, she came free into the fold of Islam. She came freely into the fold of Islam. <coughs> without any repercussion, without any recrimination. Why? It was the forgiveness of the Prophet. ﷺ. It was the rahmah of the Prophet. ﷺ. That is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, that hold to forgiveness. And command what is right. And stay away from those people who behave foolishly. My brothers and sisters in Islam, it is time for us to reflect on the seerah of the Prophet and make it part and parcel of our life every day of the year. It is time for us to look at the authenticity of the information that we have had that respect to the Quran. Not only listening to what we have to say among ourselves. Sometimes it's good to listen to what our Muslim brothers and sisters are saying. For example, Bosworth Smith, he says, it was the one miracle claim by Muhammad, his standing miracle he called it. And a miracle indeed it is. Bosworth Smith telling us that in terms of the Quran, in, in terms of the authenticity, in terms of the spirit. Recently there was another doctor from Cambridge University Oliver Lehman, that spoke, that spoke about the authenticity of the Quran and the language in terms of syntax, the language in terms of style and composition, that the Quran has been the oldest book in the Arabic language, according to him. The Quran has been the oldest book in Arabic and still maintains the authenticity of its text in terms of grammar, composition, style, and everything. It is a wonderful book that we have had, or we have, my brothers and sisters. It was the book that supported the purpose of Muhammad wasallam. It was the book that supported the mission of Muhammad wasallam. And for us to understand that purpose and mission, we need to study the Qur'an. We need to understand the Qur'an. We need to know where are the adillin, where are the evidences, where are the proofs, where are the historical facts? Where are the scientific facts? We can only know that when we study the Quran. Today we have a tendency that we study many other books in order to understand Islam. And we avoid delving into the Quran. Let us change our attitude. Let us change our approach. Let us change whatever we have in our heart and think about the greatest of the purpose of Muhammad and the greatest of his mission so that he can be part and parcel of our life, just like what Uncle Aziz was involved in. You can hear all the good works and the good things that we were talking about him. Why? Because he was inclined towards the Qur'an and the Sunnah. Because he was inclined towards the greatness of purpose and the greatness of mission that exemplified by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the understanding and may Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fill our heart, our hearts with Iman so that we can fulfill our commitment in this world and also the hereafter to enter into the world of ourselves.
and um, I see a sister put her hands up. Do you want uh, a diabetic? Uh? No, no time for question. No, we can, uh, we can time is limited. So I'm saying we should conduct this sort of thing. But when we do these things, you don't come out. That's the problem we have. These things could be arranged, and when it is arranged, you don't turn up. So you can see what you're missing and asking questions. But anyway, um, I don't have to thank Brother Y.C. part of the structure, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, now, we move to another section of it as quickly as we can. We have a sister here from Palestine, Sue. Do I have your name? Bedridden? Not Bedridden, no. Okay. Now, brothers and sisters, Palestine has been one of the most, it's not Mubarak for 30 years, or Gaddafi for 36 years, or the other one for 26 years, or whatever. This is over six decades, 60 years, that the people of Palestine have been suffering. And nobody listen. Alhamdulillah for what is happening now in the Middle East and Iran. We are all welcome to see what is happening. And we hope that a new structure will be set up. And this mosque has been most helpful and most it is a sore point as I might say where Palestine is concerned. We've sent thousands of pounds to Palestine. Gaza especially. We have a credential as well, certificates from Gaza. We have a brother here with a bullet went through his head right through in the Fotilla. You remember the Fotilla? We recently had two young brothers, 18 years old, went to Gaza as well. And one was kidnapped by the Greek ship. You remember that story? We had to send money to Greece to get him out. So this mosque is doing a lot for Gaza particularly and I'm pleased to see today that Egypt has decided to open the Rafa crossing. Alhamdulillah. And another thing is, why is it a problem for Israel or anybody else if the Iranian ship going through the Suez? When the American, the president in Egypt was sending, have sent two warships in the region. So why is the difference? Double standard. I, I, I can't say very much more, but this is a thing that uh, affects all of us in this month particularly. And it is sad to see that many of the people who demonstrated are not Muslims. I want to tell you that. Not in Egypt or anyway. In this country, many are people who are human beings. And this is not to do with Muslim. This is a humanitarian problem that is facing people around the world. And we are here to help as much as we can, but the support from everybody is not there at times, which is very surprising to me. Anyway, uh, I just want to, would you want to speak? Yes, that's the only look at as, as, uh, as, as zero. And the peace television, that piece is a uh, press. The press television, you will see straight to me. And these countries stop it, journalists, you can't get no information from this country. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, if you're sitting there, you probably won't see the slides, but um, uh, so you might want to move them. Otherwise, uh, Can you read it? Maybe. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so, I went to, my name is Sue Bearden, I went to Israel and Palestine with this program, the Ecumenical Complement Program in Palestine and Israel, which is um, a World Council of Churches project, currently involving 14 countries, and run from Britain and Ireland by Quaker people, <laughs> so witness. Um, and it sends people to the area for three months, 
uh, to accompany Palestinians and also Israeli peace groups in their daily life uh, under the Israeli occupation of the West Bank, uh, not Gaza, just the West Bank. Um, and the aims of the project, we have um, protection by presence. So we go to the area and we live amongst the Palestinian people and hopefully our presence uh, helps to protect them there. Uh, we monitor human rights, uh, so we go to checkpoints, uh, we go to various locations where um, human rights are being abused and we report those and monitor those. Um, we give support to Palestinian and Israeli peace activists in their non-violent struggle against the occupation and we do advocacy work, which is why I'm here today to advocate on behalf of the people there. Um, we, we work from a stance we call principled impartiality, which means that we don't take sides in the conflict, but we're not neutral when it comes to issues of human rights and international humanitarian law. <coughs> so, um, when I, uh, was, uh, I was placed in a place called Yanun, which is a very tiny village of fewer than 100 people, and uh, that's better, you can see that better now. Um, and this is the way up the valley, uh, through all the olive groves um, up to where I was going to stay. And you can see it's very beautiful. Uh, olive trees everywhere, limestone hills. And I must admit, I'm a bit of a, a sucker for the hills. I like hill walking, so I felt like I was going to be in my, my most heavenly place uh, being here. And um, the village itself, there it is, just nestling at the top of the valley. Um, our house was, uh, was to the right, uh, and that's where I lived with four other people from South Africa, Switzerland, Norway and Sweden, the five of us lived there. And just on the tops of the hills above the village, uh, you can just about see there's a watchtower, a white watchtower against the sky there, um, and a big building at the top which is a chicken shed. That all belongs to an illegal Israeli settlement outpost. And those um, outposts are not just illegal under international law, they are actually illegal under Israeli law. But that outpost is there about 200 metres away from the village and therein lies uh, a lot of the problems faced by the people. So this uh, lovely chap on the right here, that's uh, Rashid Murad, he's the mayor of the village of Yanun, and here he is talking to a colleague who came from Switzerland, from the... Um, Refugee Council to talk to him about displaced persons in um, Palestine. Now, Rashid knows a lot about this because. Marhaban ya 